Hello, uh, my name is Bob Tipton. I'm the founder of uh, Dark Sky Innovative Solutions. And uh, this video is a uh, briefing on our Oral Azul project and specifically how it applies to transoceanic shipping to provide cheaper electric sustainable energy. It's part of a, uh, Oral Azul is part of a systemic roadmap for turning fossil fuels into the fossils they deserve to be and global sustainability. Achieving true sustainability requires cost and business sustainability with a projected life of at least centuries. That means a projected sustainable cost advantage and adoption by privately held sustainable industry. Transoceanic shipping is an ideal candidate for uh, this technology. Our research to date has been focused on these very low end, very crude uh, kind of garage, uh, heck, most people are working with, they don't have a garage, uh, systems that can be built from PVC pipe, um, canvas or uh, kite fabric, uh, fishing line, uh, off the shelf generators, they can, uh, or first ones can be tested right off surface boats, uh, surface fishing boats in the Philippines. Uh, the collector opens, we drag it back in with almost no, with very low resistance on the rig, back to the boat, which we see here. It then closes, uh, it catches uh, the water that's flowing by with a great deal of force, and that drags this little yellow cable, which goes back to the boat, and is resisted by a generator. You can think about this as a regenerative braking in an electric vehicle, except in this case the brakes run more than the motor. When it reaches the end of a stroke, which could be like 100 meters long, it opens, we drag it back in. As we said, we drag it back in pretty quickly, we close it, and we go back to watching the thing cycle again. To do this, we have a uh, Raspberry Pi controller, we have one stepper motor, uh, we have a mechanical system for controlling uh, the open and closure from a distance, and currently we're using an e-bike motor as our generator. Uh, and as our motor. Um, the entire cost of goods on this thing is like, you know, maybe $300. Our estimate is that we can make one of these uh, at about the five kilowatt range for about the same price as a five kilowatt, you know, portable generator, like you buy down at your local Home Depot or wherever, minus the gasoline engine and minus the gas tank, which is about half the cost of the generator. If all you have left is the electric motor and a little robotic controller, a very cheap one, then we believe we can build a three to five kilowatt unit of this class for a cost of around 250 to 300 dollars in production and you can get 10 kilowatts out of it if we can get a 10-year lifespan out of it that comes down to a fraction of a cent per kilowatt hour for the actual generation cost now this unit is really just proof of concept and we're never going to operate them off the surface because of weather conditions and so forth it's just what we're using to test out the concept and try to get some videos going. What we're really looking at are putting these things underwater. All right. So on the left, we're talking to some folks in Scotland and trying to get some attention elsewhere about strapping very large ones of these on the uh, uh, bases of derelict oil rigs. We can even put them on live oil rigs if the uh, rig operator would let us. Um, in the distance there, you see a little tiny ship you know, floating on the surface. That's about the size of a uh, typical oil tanker, a uh, mid-range one. Uh, these units we're looking at here are uh, maybe, you know, 80, 100 meters across. Each one good for about a quarter megawatt. So if you strap four of these on a unit, you get a megawatt. You put eight one of these per oil rig, that's two megawatts. Uh, the U.S. government just, you know, released a couple of weeks ago that there are 130,000 derelict oil rigs in the U.S. alone. So if you're getting two megawatts by 130,000 oil rigs, this system can power the entire United States electrical grid just off the derelict oil rigs. Meanwhile, over on the video on the right, we're looking at doing these submersible units as the second tier from the ones we're researching in Bantayan. These are actually made out of PVC pipe, fabric, line, again, uh, the cheap robotic controller. Each one of these is good between maybe three to ten kilowatts. Um, we have 
roughly 3,000 uh, underemployed or unemployed uh, fishing boat crews on Bontai on Island and now alone. If each one of those is generating 10 units at 3 kilowatts, that's 30 kilowatts times 3,000 crews. We come up with numbers roughly of maybe 180 megawatts generation just off Bontayan Island. Currently, Bontayan Island only consumes 7 megawatts. So that leaves us about 180 megawatts for export to Cebu Island. Okay, um, And that's only one place in the Philippines. But uh, So we've tried to design a system which is scalable from indigenous up to oil rig systems. And scalability has been one of our primary goals throughout this entire project. Uh, so we can scale it from local indigenous things up to really, really big systems. So this video is about applying this to ocean, open blue ocean systems the size of current container ships, uh, such as uh, the ones we've seen in the news recently. We have a schematic here of a mid-range uh, container ship size vessel with a keel uh, to act as a sailboat with a couple of our new high-performance sails that we've been discussing. And in the back, you'll see a collector very similar to the ones we saw in the other ones. In fact, this is an actual copy of the one off the oil rig model. Now, what's happening here is as the wind blows the sail the boat to the right, it deploys this anchor. And when the anchor is closed, such as now, it basically tries to keep the boat from moving, producing a huge force in the cable. And that cable drives a generator, which is used to char you know, produce electricity. Uh, now, this video was squeezed down and, and sped up to fit on your screen. But uh, industrial fishing uh, boats can run these cables out half a kilometer or a kilometer or more. So this would run out there half a kilometer, maybe as far as two kilometers on this collection stroke. We would then open it, drag it back in real quickly, and let it run again. We don't have to steer the boat. It doesn't have to go anywhere. And each one of these strokes, you know, powers um, the generators. There's a popular belief in the U.S. sustainable energy community that drag machines are not scalable. We have researched this. We have dug into this. We have found out that in Europe, they just go boggle-eyed and their jaws drop going, where did you get that idea? Because, and we can't figure it out. We don't know where this came from. I'm guessing that there's a textbook out there that people read a lot, and it's a quote. Uh, but... The entire world was colonized, whether you like it or not, by square rig sailing ships, uh, which you know covered the entire planet, circumnavigated the world, and the square rig ships were basically drag machines. So the very concept that a drag machine can't be built at large scale was disproven back around the time of Columbus. Okay, we're looking at reactivating this and putting them out here um, for new collection systems. The um, the problem with sail was never efficiency. Sail was always cheap. There was you know, no fuel. The problem was in scheduling and labor. Uh, if the winds change, if the winds stop, uh, whatever, then your load is suddenly stranded in mid-ocean, sometimes for upwards of a week or two. The winds only blow on the, uh, on the routes that people want to travel. The wind only blows you know, at certain times of year. Uh, that made it for a shipping company. Oh, we'll get it there someday. It doesn't make a very good modern shipping company. And because, you know, pre-robotics, it took so many people to man all these sails, it was very, very labor intensive. So it, uh, heat, uh, coal and uh, oil-fired steam engines, they basically kicked sail out of the shipping market a century ago. But for the energy collection purposes, these ships don't actually have to go in any particular direction. Uh, they don't have to make a schedule. They can travel to wherever the wind is, wherever that happens to be. And if we look at the uh, world's ocean uh, patterns uh, in this NASA video, all of these are the major currents and activity in the ocean. Normally, we see a satellite photo of the ocean, and it's just a big expanse of boring blue. Underneath the surface, all this stuff is going on, and it's all powered by the wind. The wind blowing across the equator gets this current flowing. I'm going to pause here and roll back a second. Because we are such terrestrial land-based creatures ourselves that even though this is a, movie, a video about ocean currents and ocean energy, they actually gloss over the oceans. They hop from South America to Africa here. And as you blow through this very quickly, you won't even see this super high power current flowing across the oceans because we land critters don't care much about that. 
But out here in the oceans, coming up here on Madagascar, oh, it looks really active here on the coast where it crashes in, but there's a huge amount of energy driven by the winds out here, moving the ocean currents, coming up here through the Indian Ocean, uh, the Persian Gulf, the Red Sea, coming through here. We're now coming up through Ceylon, um, uh, Bay of Bengal. And this is where we've been working. I'm going to pause here on the Philippines for a moment. Here we go. So over here and here, this is the equatorial Pacific Current crashing in down on uh, Papua, on, um, Papua New Guinea uh, down here. And you can see it's coming in uh, and crashing into Mindanao Island in the Philippines. And it's particularly active uh, down here in uh, the Banda Sea. Um, and you can see a little bit here, the Pacific Current comes squirting right through these channels into the Bahal Sea and the Sulu Sea. And right here, if you can see the pointer, this little tiny, tiny strip of water between these two islands here is the Tanyan Strait. And where you can't see is a little tiny dot of an island up here, and that's Bantayan, where we're working. And we've done computations that show that the amount of water flowing in and out of the Tanyan Strait is about 110 billion cubic meters per day. That's about four to five times as much as the estimated entire rainfall, rivers, and so forth of the entire Amazon jungle, all squeezing in and out of this little tiny channel in here. And that contains about 14 gigawatts, completely based on the tides. And in this video, which is major ocean currents, it shows up as, well, nothing. Because this video doesn't take into account uh, tidal currents. It only takes into account the, you know, the, the primary currents. This is going on through every one of these bodies of water in the Philippines, which has 7,400 islands, plus the oceanic current plus the difference in sea depths and so forth. So for our research purposes, this makes the Philippine Islands in here uh, ocean energy wonderland. I mean, it's just amazing down in here. And the people need the power and so forth. And that's uh, why we chose this as our base of operations. But for the transoceanic shipping community, they've got the whole world. And that's really what we're trying to put across here is that we can power or collect power from two thirds of the Earth's surface, both anchored in shallower waters, uh, anchored in deep water, off of oil rigs, off of narrow channels, off of circulation areas. We're going to see the Japan's going by, and then we fly over the ocean again because you know we don't we people don't care much about the ocean. But as we get over here into the Americas, you can begin to see the equatorial Pacific currents. Here it goes flying by. We're going to fly right by it over here. And we can see, oh my God, look at that power flowing by there. And those are the winds driving the currents. So for power generation, the ships we just were discussing, they don't need to go anywhere in particular. They just need to go find where the wind is, drop their uh, brakes, and collect energy almost anywhere. And we can populate the ocean surface collecting energy and totally untapped sustainable energy at costs lower than anything in the market. That is Oro Azul's pitch, and specifically to container shipping. We're talking virtually free energy from the entire ocean. Uh, dark skies pending patents are for devices using the pumping action common to all of these designs to generate energy. Just to be clear, we're talking about we own the concept of a free flow ocean pump without cylinders. We're patenting the generator and the pumping action and the patent of opening and closing a collector in order to collect power. We have filed no patents on the shapes of any of these collectors because we're sure they're going to change over time. And within five years, no one will be using collectors that look anything like anything we have here on the screen. And from our cost estimates, based on standard engineering practice, if you dig through catalogs and you dig up life cycle costs and you divide it out over time, our predictions go that on all of these systems, we can generate energy at one one hundredth of a U.S. cent per kilowatt hour out in the ocean. The current average worldwide is 11 cents. Uh, natural gas at its cheapest and wind are running about 5 cents. Well, that makes us one five hundredth the cost of the most of the least expensive systems available today. To me, that counts as virtually free energy. 
But virtually free energy, thousands of kilometers from shore, is of little to no value. So the next piece of Oro Azul's technology, also patent pending, describes how to get that energy to shore at cost from 4.5 down to 0.5 US cents per kilowatt hour. Our solutions begin with off-the-shelf batteries transported by container ship to deep water high pressure electrolysis of water. Uh, this part of Oro Azul doesn't have eye-catching graphics or videos. It's a lot of numbers, chemistry, physics that reduce down to this chart. Um, the lower half of the chart is a breakdown of uh, world, you know, estimates we found from various reliable sources of current uh, costs of energy generation. And these are very subject to which source you use. These seem to be representative and they also change by the season and the cost of fuel and the weather. Uh, the, ch uh, the most expensive Oro Azul system is the one we're beginning with. That uses, uh, that estimate was based on the cost of uh, wind farm deep cycle lead acid batteries, which are good for about 2,000 to 2,200 cycles before they need to be recycled. Uh, our next cheapest system is actually using mechanical uh, uh, compressors to compress atmosphere down into deep water and shipping compressed air underwater. We come up with just under one cent per kilowatt hour. Our next cheapest is our hydrogen solution, which we're focusing on for the rest of the briefing. Um, and the, uh, if it, when it comes onto the marketplace, the cheapest means of transmission will be the up and coming sodium glass batteries, which are coming in uh, at our half cent per kilowatt hour figure. And all of these are based on um, catalog prices, catalog pricing, as this technology grows and is refined, those prices will come down. For the container shipping industry, we are proposing beginning with off-the-shelf batteries stored in ISO shipping containers based on catalog prices and a life cycle of about 2,000 cycles deep cycle lead acid batteries shipped across the Pacific, the entire Pacific, by container ship yield roughly 4.5 US cents per kilowatt hour. This is the battery tech most common in wind and solar farms. Now, everybody's excited about lithium batteries because we're being used in uh, vehicles. Um, well, lithium battery technology has higher energy density and lower weight, which makes them ideal for cars, and, uh, and vehicles because you get to pam pam uh, cram more energy into you know, less weight. It costs more and has shorter life due to dendrite formation. Uh, there are a few people out there who are very unhappy uh, putting their uh, electric vehicle up as a used car because it needs a new 20,000 battery and a dollar battery. And that's when they find out that their electric car, half the price was the battery. Um, our approach is not dependent on what battery tech is chosen. If you can find a better uh, battery that lasts longer at lower cost, by all means, use it. That is actually a case in our point, because if you can find a better battery, a cheaper that lasts longer, that four and a half cents will come down, because almost all that cost is going into the cost of the battery. We're proposing using our deep water high pressure electrolysis, DWHPE tech for phase two. DWHPE, based on existing HPE, is based on utilizing the extremely high pressure at great depth underwater to provide free compression of the hydrogen and oxygen produced by electrolysis. Uh, most of us in school or in you know, videos somewhere have seen the electrolysis videos. You take a little beaker of water, a battery, a couple of wires, you poke it in the water and bubbles start pouring off. And sometimes they even light a match and show that the hydrogen burns. Well, that's electrolysis. Uh, more advanced chemistry classes, you'll go through the uh, chemical dynamics, energy equations of the process, and you'll find out that only about 80%, 85% of the energy from the battery gets stored in uh, the actual hydrogen. So it's an energy, you lose energy on the, elect on the electrolysis. But what most of us never caught on to was in that chemical formula, pressure is not a term. And that's not an accident. It turns out from experimentation that no matter what pressure you do this under, except maybe like you know super you know thousands of you know atmospheres, um, the energy required to split the water into hydrogen and oxygen is the same. So if you want to split a beaker of water on your table in your house, 
Uh, it costs, you know, a certain amount of energy. If we want to split that water at the bottom of the Mariana Trench, it takes the same energy. What people seem to have overlooked was that that gas, both the hydrogen and the oxygen, produced by this uh, splitting at high pressure, is the gas is at high pressure. It's at the ambient pressure of the ocean. So at a depth of 500 meters, the pressure of the gases is about 50 bar, 50 atmospheres. That's roughly the pressure of the power stroke on a car engine. Uh, the power stroke is when you squirt the gas into the piston and hit the spark plug. The gas explodes, driving the engine. That explosion, the pressure from that explosion, is about 50 atmospheres. And every time you drive your car, 50 atmospheres of pressure is running your car. And maybe 60 you know, atmospheres of pressure is driving Daytona race cars. If you take that depth down lower, down to 900 meters, well, um, if you use adiabatic heat exchangers, we'll get to that in a second, the gases can be liquefied. Now, an adiabatic process, for me, was covered in my freshman earth science uh, class in, um, in high school. Uh, adiabatic means uh, no heat goes in and out of the, of the gas. So when hot air rises over the fields in Kansas, as it, as it rises up into the air, uh, the pressure drops, the air expands, it gets colder, it creates clouds, it creates rain. Uh, adiabatic expansion is a fundamental part of the entire weather cycle. To an engineer, it means there's no heat change. And there's lots of methods of you know, uh, doing adiabatic expansion. So to use uh, DWHPE as a fuel source, there are many ways of using highly compressed hydrogen for fuel. What we and I you know, or at the Oral Azul project recognized is that when the gases are expanded adiabatically from these very high pressures, they become so cold they can be used to drive existing heat engines in reverse. Uh, all heat engines work by uh, superheating air inside a closed container which produces a huge pressure compared to the outside air and that pressure pushes a piston, spins a turbine, uh, does something. And that expanding gas is what drives the engine. And to drive that engine, it takes the heat from the fire and, uh, and dumps it into the atmosphere as it expands, so they are heat generating engines. What we recognized was that with these very, very cold gases, and sometimes liquefied gases, the heat source and the cold sink reversed. The environment is now the fire, and the fuel is now the cold. So to boil or expand uh, what, what engineers call the working gas, we suck heat out of the air, out of the ocean, out of the air conditioner, whatever, and we pump it into these super cold gases. They expand and they drive engines uh, before the hydrogen is, uh, hydrogen is burned. Once we've gotten all the energy out from the endothermic expansion, we then burn the hydrogen and get that energy as well. We actually can get energy out of the com uh, super cold uh, oxygen itself. We're calling this cryogenic cogeneration, all of which goes into the ocean energy cycle. Dark sky's ocean energy cycle is a patent pending process that is similar to other power cycles, such as steam, auto, diesel, Stirling, and Brayton. Uh, most of you uh, don't recognize these names. I think most of us recognize the steam engine. Some of us recognize the diesel engine. I think all of us recognize the diesel engine. Um, they're all named after the engineer, uh, very rarely a scientist, but the engineer who discovered and you know, documented these cycles. Uh, Otto was a German. He came up with the four-cycle car engine. Diesel was a German. He came up with the uh, diesel engine, which are very similar. Um, Sterling and Brayton were, were Brits. Uh, Sterling came up with the ideal heat engine. It's very rarely been used in practice. It's a fairly complex engine, but it has the highest efficiency. NASA sometimes uses them. And Brayton. Brayton is the one who developed the uh, heat engine behind uh, turbine engines, like power jet airplanes. Um, so the ocean energy cycle we're talking about here is very similar to those. It documents where you compress the gas, where you expand the gas, how you get the work out of the gas, and so forth. But in our case, the process can be summarized as collecting energy far from shore, converting it to a transmissible form, shipping it to shore where it's used. 
there are pages and pages behind the patent of how we do this, but it amounts to a global long distance scale version of these fundamental engine cycles. For transoceanic shipping, the stored energy would be used to power the transport ships themselves. And just to be clear, the ships doing the collection with the sails are not the ones doing the transport. One set of ships collects the energy, puts it into a usable form, that gets put into the transport, uh, ships that actually do the transportation. Um, if the ships doing the transportation have excess energy at the end of their uh, delivery cycle, when they get to port, they can actually dump the energy uh, they don't need and sell it on the market uh, uh, to power you know stuff on land par and power the grid <sighs> so what dark sky has now at this point we have theoretical concepts patents pending and enough confirmation by qualified reviewers to be confident dark skies Oro azul tech has the potential to power the world for centuries to come at lower cost than any other method in today's marketplace. We even have agreements with the local government on Bontine Island to perform live field testing. Now, none of you have heard of Bontine Island, I'm guessing. I'm guessing none of you have heard of Cebu Island. Um, well, to get to Bontine Island, you first have to fly to Manila on Luzon Island and then fly to uh, Mactan uh, Island uh, next to Cebu Island, then you have to you know, drive over the bridge to Cebu Island, drive across Cebu Island, and take a ferry over to Bantayan Island. Well, our local agreements are with the municipal government of the municipality of Bantayan, and the agreement is that they have even more obscure islands just off their coast, which are small little islands, which maybe have five or ten uh, local fishing families living on these islands. And these island islanders are living in uh, primitive huts with possibly dirt floors. Uh, they don't have uh, cell service. They don't have satellite. They don't definitely don't have fiber or cable. Everything they have is running off of gas-powered portable generators, just like the ones you dial you buy down at Home Depot. They can't even afford to run these 24 hours a day. Uh, a gallon of gas, last I checked on Bontine Island, was costing between seven and eight dollars a gallon. A typical fisherman on Bontayan Island is making $5 a day. So it's about two days wages to buy a gallon of gas to fire up the portable generator. So uh, the municipal councilors uh, who just got reelected, thankfully, at Bontayan Island have already made an agreement with us that if we can power uh, these little communities on these uh, little islands, which are right in the highest velocity flow in the entire archipelago that we're working at, using our systems, and we can demonstrate that it works, even if it's labor intensive and it works, then they will look at migrating this into powering the entire island, and they will discontinue the request to run an undersea cable from the neighboring island to power theirs. Getting the permit to run the undersea cable through the environmental sanctuary of the uh, Tanyan Strait has been going on for about five years, and it's expected to go on for 10 more years before they get a permit to lay a cable. And our tech doesn't require putting anything on the seafloor. So they are really excited. So we have all this in place today. What Dark Sky is seeking, we are struggling to build minimum size demonstration units funded by our founder, that's me, and small donations from a few true believers, friends, contacts, friends of friends. And that's going to take us, so I don't know how long it's going to take us to do that with the current uh, supply problem, not even going to ship parts. So we are seeking roughly $1 million in initial R&D funding to produce, test, and document technology demonstrators. In exchange, we are offering preferential licensing agreements and participation during the design process. Why roughly $1 million? We have found there is a wide variation in what different people consider adequate proof. We've spoken with engineers who regard hanging a collector off a bridge adequate. That was me. I thought I could hang one off a bridge and the whole world would send me money. Eh, that was wrong. I've spoken with speculators who demand eight months of at-sea operations and videos before they will go out and put their name on stuff to raise funds. And I've run across people in universities, the academic crowd, the acad academicians, who require volumes of academic studies and laboratory testing in order to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that this stuff works. 
Each of these has a different cost. So we're leaving the choice to the funders. If you are satisfied with a low-end demonstration, get some units out there, have to, we can do that for about a million over the next 12 to 18 months. If you want academic backup and research studies and flow tunnel and computational fluid dynamics work, each one of those is going to cost a couple hundred thousand dollars, doing enough of those to get real proof and all the journal articles, especially to do it triply to make sure no one, you know, says only uh, one of these came up with the proof. And that could go up to 20, 30 million dollars. So it's really up to what people want to put into the funding. If the transoceanic shipping industry has a uh, seaworthy container ship hull whose internals have gone bad, the, the engine's shot, you know, whatever. And if they want to retrofit that uh, with sail and put a bunch of electric generators in it and an electric motor to pilot around, uh, we're perfectly happy going in and making that one of our first demonstrations. We will, of course, be routing some of the money we get for, you know, our work back into our Bantayan project because we are fully committed to getting the indigenous peoples in Bantayan up and going and all over the world. It's really up to the people funding us. What do you want us to demonstrate? What do you need from us? And then we'll discuss how much it's going to cost to do that. And that gets into a bit of haggling. Why are we talking to the transoceanic shipping industry? They have no viable alternative to oil and coal. Most of it's oil. It is one of the largest contributors to CO2 emissions. The cost of fuel is a primary component to their product price. Most companies are long-lived, have strong financial positions, are privately held, and are comfortable taking short-term risks for very long-term gains. The industry has an expected lifespan in centuries. So, think about it this way, folks. You can't ship it by air. We're not building railroads across the oceans. The dirigible idea never worked out. Container shipping and cargo shipping across the oceans is the only way to get stuff that exists in one part of the world across the ocean to somewhere else. Container shipping and oceanic shipping is not going away any time in the foreseeable future. Okay, they are here to stay. So, a centuries-long solution to fuel, to fuel their ships, should be a very attractive proposition. They are the masters of low-cost ocean operations. And since the whole Oro Azul ocean energy plan is based on absolute minimization of cost, we want to work with the masters of, work, of using the world's oceans at minimum cost. And that's why we're approaching the transoceanic shipping industry. Well, that's the Oro Azul transoceanic shipping presentation by Dark Sky Innovative Solutions and me, Bob Tipton. For more information, uh, you can contact uh, me through info at darkskyinnovation.com. Uh, we'll be posting this on YouTube and getting our website up and going. Check it out there. This is just one of a series of videos, each one targeted at different niche applications, very large niche applications for how we can use our technologies. And there will also be a series of educational videos so that you can understand how this stuff works. Uh, while all of it is really based on almost entirely freshman engineering, and in most cases, high school physics and chemistry courses, other than high school kids and college kids, most of us don't remember this stuff. Only a few oddball, eclectic uh, aerospace rocket scientists such as myself have to live with this stuff day in and day out and remember all of it in one place. So we're going to be putting those videos together. There's gonna, the next video in line is going to be one specifically on our Philippine indigenous solution. Uh, that one's going to be targeted at, at folks in the Philippines, India, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, Papua New Guinea, Northern Australia. Um, and then we're going to be doing the oil rig videos and so forth. But it's all the same concepts. It's basically this oceanic pump, um, the fact that we don't require a seafloor infrastructure, and the rest of it. So thank you for listening. This is uh, just one entry in the entire set. And uh, if you know someone who's interested in stuff, please feel free to pass it along. Have a good day, evening, or morning, and whatever you're having at the moment.
Um, Americans don't know much about the Philippines. Sorry, it keeps uh, backstepping instead of pausing on the video. So I'm going to try to hop back over here to where I was. All right. Actually, going to go back. That was Japan flowing by there. Let's go back here a bit further. Uh, here we go. Coming up on the Philippines again. Don't hit the space bar, Bob. 